What makes nanosatellites so powerful is their ability to work together in groups, known as constellations. But projected numbers of satellites are becoming so large that these new groups are often referred to as swarms. So you might have a swarm of satellites where basically some satellites are generating power to provide power to other satellites which are doing communications, to provide communications to other satellites which are basically doing Earth observation or something. So that's one concept. Typically, the terminology we use, constellation, we literally mean the same way as constellation of stars. And constellations aren't anything new. The various GPS constellations have been existing for 20 years, but not on the scale that we're talking about now. These are constellations which aren't maybe 100 spacecraft. These are constellations or planned constellations of hundreds, potentially thousands, potentially more. This is about covering the globe, basically, with the equivalent of internet broadband. Different types of satellites occupy different orbits. For simplicity, these are often broken down into three categories. High Earth orbit is used by geostationary satellites that need to stay constantly above one place over the Earth, such as for telecommunication. Medium Earth orbit is used by navigation and communication satellites, satellites designed to monitor a particular region on Earth and those involved in space observation. And low Earth orbit is most commonly used for satellite imaging. It's also where you'll find the International Space Station. And it's here that the current and planned nano-satellite constellations exist. But none of this would be possible without a cost-effective way to launch them. Five, four, three, two, one. Ten or 15 years ago, there were only something like 12 um, companies globally who were actually launching things into space. And many of those belong to international governments and organizations like the European Space Agency. Today, we've got in excess of 300 companies globally trying to build launch vehicles of some flavor. Many of them have yet to actually build a rocket. Some of them have managed to build rockets which have spectacularly gone sideways as well as go up. Other companies who have been doing this for a while now have actually managed to create a market launching small rockets, relatively small, lifting um, hundreds of kilos, and effectively started to compete with the other companies offering services out there. And what this has done is it's driven down the cost of access to space. Meaning, instead of paying tens of thousands of dollars per kilo, you can now pay as little as 5,000. Certain companies have made space look really simple. That's not necessarily true. Space is hard, it's really hard. It's all about speed. So small rockets can't go that fast. They don't have enough thrust to go that fast. So typically small rockets will put things into the lower orbit. The big rockets, they can put things into high orbits. But of course, there's a different way to put things in high orbits as well. And that is to give whatever it is you're launching into space its own small propulsion unit. Do you want to get there fast, which can be expensive? Um, or do you want to get there slowly, which can be cheap? But the question is, is how fast do you need to be there? At Long Beach, California, Virgin Orbit are ramping up production of their rocket, Launcher One, which instead of taking off vertically, is designed to be deployed horizontally from the wing of a plane at 35,000 feet, meaning it is able to avoid weather patterns that can often delay a launch. Measuring 70 feet long, this two-stage rocket is able to carry payloads weighing up to half a ton. Back in 2012, we, we started the development on our Newton family of engines. We started building out our manufacturing facility with the intent that we were going to ramp up to something like 15 to 20 rockets in the, in the next few years. But the traditional way rockets have been constructed in the past meant that if they were to achieve the level of production needed, they and the rest of the industry would have to change the way rockets are made, particularly at the business end, known as the combustion chamber. That process traditionally took over a year to build one chamber, and we need two of them, one for each stage. That represents a lead time that we want to look at reducing. Now, we still have to maintain the high quality because that's obviously a very critical part in us getting to orbit. So what we've looked at is a combination of, of manufacturing that what we call hybrid manufacturing. It's a combination of 3D printing. In some cases, we're actually doing that with lasers and material to actually deposit 
uh, metals and others to actually form the structure. But then we do a number of things where we do subtractive manufacturing or typical machining. We will take that printed part and actually machine it down to get other finishes. The combination of the two allows us to dramatically bring down not only the cost, but the time. Things that used to take over a year, we can bring down into the realm of one or two months. It can also bring down the weight, and it can bring down the total cost of those parts. The initial missions, which have a 100% success rate, have all taken place at Mojave, California. But the team are now developing a more portable mission control setup, enabling them to operate from what they call spaceports, based at existing runways all over the world. When it came to choosing a plane to launch from, one candidate stood out as the natural choice. When Boeing's design team drew up plans for the giant 747 airliner back in the 1960s, little could they have imagined that over 40 years after its maiden flight, it would be embarking on a whole new career in the space industry. Something that really was helpful for us when we were investigating which aircrafts to consider and use is that it's actually designed to carry a fifth engine. The fifth engine mount was incorporated into the design as a way to transport spare engines around the world. Although seldom used for its original purpose, this fifth pylon was perfectly positioned to take the weight of a small rocket. But there was also another advantage it held over its more modern counterparts. The, the 747 itself is not a fly-by-wire aircraft, and that actually has a good advantage for us. Which means that instead of the flight controls going via a computer, the pilot controls the aircraft manually. As we perform this zoom launch release maneuver, we get to a very high pitch attitude at 32 and a half degrees with a rapidly decreasing airspeed. We don't want a computer to think that we're in a situation we shouldn't be in and, and take over for us. Launch vehicles are probably one of the most challenging things we can do in the space industry. If you think about a launch vehicle, it has to work perfectly for minutes or at most hours. Perfectly, because you are moving at incredibly high speeds we're not commanding at real time. It's basically being controlled by a computer. And if it doesn't work perfectly, we don't get our customers into space. We have incredibly smart and dedicated people working on this problem, but I never assume that everything will go perfectly. So there's always a little bit of a knot in my stomach. Never take it for granted. Because what we do is really, really hard, but we are really, really good at it. So on launch day, I am in the control room, so I actually start uh, my shift about 10 hours before we get to our drop point. So the team comes in and we are working through making sure the vehicle and the plane and the ground systems are all functioning and are, are working as expected. Once pre-flight and system checks are completed, the rocket is fueled and it's time to hand over responsibility to the air crew. We have two pilots on board flying the plane and two launch engineers that are then responsible for monitoring the rocket. And uh, once then the whole system takes off, that crew has the full command and control capability of the launch platform and the launch system. Despite all the cutting edge technology and autonomous rocket systems, this part of the mission still requires the skill, experience and hand-to-eye coordination of a human. Chief Pilot Eric Bippert. I, I kind of feel like the field goal kicker in American football. Um, you know, at the end of a big game, you know, the entire team has done just all this amazing work, and then it's up to one person. This is where Eric's many years of experience of precision flying with the U.S. Air Force and as a test pilot really comes into its own. He must position the aircraft at exactly the right place at the right time and at a speed so precise that it cannot be allowed to vary by more than one knot. It's very hands-on flying. We cannot use the autopilot. We cannot use the auto throttles. There is a certain amount of pressure. Uh, but to be totally honest, with the training that I've had and once we get into execution, I, I don't even think about that pressure. You know, I just think about doing what I need to do, you know, to, to actually release it successfully. As a test pilot, I have a lot of experience flying different maneuvers with very tight tolerances, and this is right up to par with that. After we make the inbound turn to the launch point, 
but we'll accelerate from Mach 0.7 to Mach 0.85. So with about 25 seconds prior to drop, uh, we'll go ahead and execute that release maneuver. Uh, that involves a uh, approximately a 2G pull-up. And we'll basically pull the nose up to uh, 32 and a half degrees. Uh, so once we're all set and all the parameters, uh, I'll call release, release, release. And at that point, the, uh, the co-pilot will reach up uh, to um, a button that's mounted above the dash and press the actual release button. You feel and you immediately know that it's released because the aircraft will immediately start uh, this nice right-hand big turn. Five seconds after release, uh, there's a delay on the rocket and it'll ignite um, after that five second uh, delay. And it's something we can't see because we're in that bank, but you can actually hear it. And it's this loud rumble and it, it actually resonates, you know, within your body. It's, it's a, a really neat experience and a great chance just to look out the window and we can see this bright bloom from the rocket as it heads into space. And uh, it's, it's special. It's a, it's a very special experience. Although the proliferation of launch vehicles is helping to drive down costs, launching a satellite can be even cheaper if you're prepared to ride share. <laughs> 